many facets of the future are appearing in our midst right now new and unorthodox methods of healing and health new ways of learning new ways of reclaiming and expressing personal power many ancient arts are being resurrected and given futuristic application pour yourself a cup of tea and join dr helen v walker and her guests as they discuss many interesting facets of the future I'm Helen Walker, and I welcome you to Facets of the Future. We're going to be speaking today uh, about the subject of sacred architecture. We have as our guest Robert Gulick, who is an architect, a city planner, um, uh, or planning commissioner. He has spent a good 17 years or more in the field of architecture designing uh, public buildings, institutional buildings, uh, uh, shopping centers, and so forth. But his real love is sacred architecture. And in this field, he has been uh, studying the theory and the practice and now using it in his uh, everyday work. Sounds like quite an impressive background, Bob, and I certainly welcome you to our show. Thank you, Helen. Would you like to join me with a cup of tea as we share some of these ideas? I do feel that sacred architecture is not only a fascinating subject, but perhaps it needs a bit of definition. What is sacred and what is architecture? Well, let's start with the architecture uh, as a generic term. We are talking about how one crafts or creates or makes first principles or archetypes uh, into matter and so in that sense we are all architects we are all creators in matter and that is part of the discipline that we have here in that this earth experience that kind of ties into the idea of we create our own reality we really are architects of our world aren't we? exactly exactly the sacredness has to do with the idea that behind all of manifestation there is this divine thought the spiritual impulse or force which creates or manifests this thing in, in physical form. And that through design, we can establish a link from our experiential realm back to the source. And mm -hmm. that we do this consciously with intent, with full knowledge. And so that if we are practicing sacred architecture, we are applying natural law to what we create and thereby connecting back to the source of our being. And so the, the sacred part is just that, connecting back to the source. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And how do you apply this in the, the planning of uh, edifices that you uh, work with? Well, I do it on the sly. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, most clients today uh, certainly are not attuned to the idea that there is a spiritual component to ourselves that needs to be addressed. Uh, and their primary interests are in making a profit. Um, the sacred approach certainly doesn't cost more, and the benefits uh, are there to be had. It needs to be practiced more, so uh, as things happen that are beneficial, I will tell a client about it. But uh, primarily, it's application of proportion and measure and uh, patterns to what I design. As I understand, uh, sacred geometry is really something that the ancients practiced. Well, yes, um, the, the tradition in sacred architecture comes to us through ancient traditions, and there are pieces of it that are embodied in many traditions from mystical Islam, which we call Sufi, to Pythagorean tradition, to Tantra, which is the mystical tradition of, of uh, Hindu, for example. All these have a piece of the mirror, a piece of the knowledge, which is now in the process of being reconstituted into a larger picture and at the same time being validated by modern science. Those mystical metaphysical principles are now having scientific theory that gives them some credibility. Wonderful. How did you get involved in this or become interested in it, Bob? Well, it's a long story. <laughs> but began uh, about 12 years ago with a series of what we now call paranormal experiences that my wife and I had together, which in a sense rang our bell, shook our tree a little bit, and 
caused us to have to reevaluate our definitions of reality. And in the process of that, in the search, which is quite exciting, uh, is, is a heady experience, the vision quest, uh, I learned that I could apply the metaphysical wisdom I was gaining to my professional practice in architecture. That is wonderful. I think so many of us have had a tendency to separate the metaphysical principle we learned on the one hand with our daily living on the other. Oh yeah, once you, once you accept this view of reality, you have to incorporate it into your daily life. It, it's a full-time thing. It's something that's in the top of your consciousness at all times. And it's something we all could do, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yes, yes indeed. So uh, <clears throat> tell me more about how you uh, <clears throat> got into using sacred architecture. Well, at a certain point in this investigation, I came across uh, a series of information. One, for example, was from Gurdjieff. Uh, Gurdjieff is a Russian mystic, was a Russian mystic, um, whose tradition is Sufi, and his teachers were in ancient Persia. And he talks about a monastery that had a room in it which, when you entered the room, caused you to weep. There was a weeping of joy, not of sadness. And he said that it was a result of the composition of architectural elements. So it, is the room itself and the architecture that evoke that emotion? It creates a field to which mm -hmm. uh, there is a resonant response from the patterns that are already within your mind that evokes that state of being which is reflected by the geometry of the room itself. And here we have really the basis of sacred architecture and what we try to uh, accomplish within the temple. And you were, uh, uh, did you actually visit that or have you experienced rooms like this? No, my, my visitations have been uh, on a mental uh, level uh, at Good, this point. Good, then I can go too. Because you can go too. That is wonderful. I think that all of us have perhaps um, been in cathedrals or in buildings that seemingly um, evoke certain emotions, but we didn't know why. Right, right. There uh, was an ancient wisdom. Uh, the ancients did have this knowledge. They consciously applied it to what they created. It was built into architecture because the architecture survived. They were books that we could read in the future where the books on paper, for example, would not survive. And that's why there's so much wisdom built into edifices. In fact, a uh, building like uh, Chartres Cathedral was built specifically when the teaching was known to be going out, being suppressed. And uh, the alchemists, mm -hmm. the Rosicrucians, the Kabbalists all came together to impart their knowledge into this creation. Little did the Pope know, I think, <laughs> what was really being built into Chartres Cathedral. I think that uh, some of us have visited that cathedral, mm -hmm. and I'm going to uh, go back again, <laughs> whether it's in mind or in, yeah. uh, in the physical, and see if I can understand some of those uh, principles that are involved. Would you find it from your own inner feelings that you would uh, find some of those principles, or is it something you must study? I think there's a combination of that, that uh, the validation in terms of um, what, what is written, what is designed, what is built, supports the intuitive wisdom that we're all now beginning to get. And so it's a combination synthesizing what we see on the outside with what we know to be truth uh, as we are remembering inside. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed you have a book here, Bob, that uh, is a very interesting book on sacred geometry. Uh, is this one of the things that inspired you? Well, this would be uh, the first book I would suggest anyone read if they are interested in pursuing the subject. It is probably the most comprehensive, although, as I'm saying, this, the wisdom is not put together very well in one place. It's in bits and pieces here and there. But this book, I think, synthesizes it as well as any. That's wonderful. It's a book called Sacred Geometry written by Robert Lawler. Robert Lawler. Yes. Um, you say that this is something that any one of us can read without it being too technical. Not only readable, it also has some geometrical exercises. So if you actually would like to start to learn the geometer's trade using the compass and, and straight edge, there are a series of diagrams that uh, will lead you into the knowledge actually through your hands as well as through your mind. Through your hands as well as the mind. Yes. Great. Haptic. <laughs> yes. Well, I know that um, uh, you have a number of slides and things like that to explain some of this for us. And so we're going to take a short break now. And when we come back, um, we will see some of those slides. So be sure to stay with us. Welcome back. 
We're talking today with Robert Gulick, an architect um, whose special interest is sacred architecture. So on the sacred architecture, um, uh, I know that there are certain principles that you use. Well, there are actually two um, disciplines that we can talk about. One is called sacred geometry. And the discipline or the information comes to us primarily through Pythagoras, whose teachings were from Egypt, from Pythagoras that went to um, Arabic, uh, the mystical traditions of Islam, and then through Spain to Europe to what we have now. The Pythagoreans uh, held that the source of form of energy was basically number. Mm -hmm. And the temple itself, uh, in, in whether you're talking about the Hindu temple or Mayan temple or Hawaiian temple, were based on cosmological diagrams, which were basically oh. schemes of number translated into form. Okay? Can we have the, uh, the title slide that uh, has sacred architecture on it? Um, now, numbers represented cosmic principles. They were right. not quantities. In the same way that these were translated into letters of the alphabet, our language itself embodies the same kind of cosmological diagrams that the ancients incorporated in the temples. The letters of our alphabet actually stand for cosmic principles. So when we talk, we are speaking the language of the cosmos. The same with tones. Each letter has a tone associated with it, and a tone represents a cosmic principle. Each tone represents Certainly. a cosmic principle. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. So if we were to go on to the next slide, uh, the, the next series of slides are going to demonstrate, a, hopefully, uh, a theory. A theory okay. which I uh, now call uh, the theory of transformative design. The use of Trans design, mm -hmm. transformative design. The use of design principles in order to accomplish a transformation. Here we see a crystal lattice of diamonds. Mm -hmm. uh, which is symbolic and representative of uh, geometry we find throughout nature, not only in physical form, whether we're talking about chemical bonding, of which this is an example, or in process. The solar system, for example, as a process, growth follows a geometrical structure. Um, this we find throughout nature. And it is within nature that we see the cosmological principles that are universal that we can then apply to the design of our world. And of course we see the Trinity that we hear so much about in all religions. Certainly the Trinity or the triangle is the form through which all the forms are created. You know, this is one of the sacred uh, geometrical principles. So if we move on to the next slide then we have in Hindu tradition what is called the Sri Yantra, the, the holiest yantra, which is a cosmological diagram which symbolizes the whole of the universe, the totality of existence. The process of meditating sequentially through the forms of this yantra, of this diagram, will bring one into alignment with the totality of existence which it represents. Okay. So then in the next uh, slide we have an Islamic pattern which is the same kind of principle but here's a different tradition. We have Hindu, now we have Islam. The Islamic tradition we have uh, the essence, the creative thought represented as pure geometry. And out of this pure geometry, we have spring spiral arabesques, this flowering growth that uh, symbolizes manifestation in life. Okay. But the underlying principle is geometry. And we certainly see this, of course, uh, in all the mandalas, which these are. Right. Uh, right. And when we meditate upon the mandala, we really are going through this progression, aren't we? Well, in fact, you're attuning your mind sequentially to a resonant pattern of forms. Okay, as we as we enter in mentally through the mandala, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next slide actually is a computer-generated model of DNA. This, oh, really? Yes. Now this is uh, a view that we aren't used to seeing because it's taken actually looking down the molecule where we're used to seeing it looking linearly, the spiral double helix. Okay, so here we have DNA as a mand as a mandala basically as pure geometry, which is responsible for our inherited characteristics. And so on a biological level, we see the same thing that we've saw, seen in mandalas of mystical traditions. So even in the DNA, we're reenacting the universe, aren't we? Yes, we're following an ancient pattern, <laughs> certainly. <laughs> Fabulous. Yes, uh-huh. Okay, in the next slide, uh, we have an example of uh, 
forces within nature exhibiting a geometric field. Now this happens to be electromagnetic where we're seeing two poles of a magnet and the mm -hmm. force field that that creates. So we have forces in nature uh, as an example of pure geometry. Now we could look at this and uh, also say that these are like uh, gravitational bodies in what Einstein called the four-dimensional space-time continuum in which gravity as a, as a force is simply a manifestation of the bending of space and time. Okay? In other words, mm -hmm. forces are a manifestation of geometry. Okay? Back again this, to numbers. Mm -hmm. This is a conclusion of modern physics. As a matter of fact, John Wheeler is a famous uh, quantum physicist uh, has concluded that physics is geometry, very simply. Okay. And geometry is life. Okay. Uh, there's the familiar <coughs> yin-yang. Yeah, exactly, the familiar yin-yang. Now, um, if we were to try to diagram the theories of modern science that are coming up with uh, the dualities of existence where we have antimatter and matter, or we have uh, particle and wave as two complementary states of matter you know, that exist side by side, or we have the idea of the interchangeability of energy and matter within mm -hmm. the constant of light, you know, E equals mc squared, we would have these dualities, energy and matter, and what relates them is light, which is essentially a vibration, electromagnetic vibration, which is what the sine wave, the curve, represents. It separates these two dual dualities. And altogether, then, we have a trinity within this. It's not just a duality, it's a trinity. It is two that are three that are one. That are one. I had never thought of it in that way. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, as a, we saw in the Taoist symbol, that this process of dualities creates this vibration, right? Mm -hmm. All right. that the process of creation is created by this vibration. We see here an example of a form that's actually created by sonic vibration. This is called a cymatic pattern. It's created in a oil liquid by acoustic vibration. Um, sound has by created sound. that. Sound has actually created this form. The conclusion uh, of science and what we see from metaphysics also is that form itself is the mediating principle between consciousness and matter. In other words, mind incarnates or embodies itself in physical mm -hmm. substance through the medium of form. And it is then through form that we can then reconnect through and connect to our source. Well, we certainly see the importance of where we are then mm -hmm. in our uh, spiritual unfoldment. We are here in form right now right. in matter, right. and it is the connecting link. That's right. That's right. So then in our next one, we have a similar uh, kind of idea, this being a, uh, a X-ray diffraction photograph of iridium atoms as a vibratory field. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, almost as like as a cymatic pattern. Uh, each state of matter, and this is another conclusion of modern physics, occupies a characteristic state of vibration. Uh, and so we can conclude that uh, tuning into a higher state of awareness is basically then tuning into the right frequency. Mentally attuning ourselves by a sympathetic resonance to that formal pattern which is reflective of or characteristic of that state or that dimension that we're trying to reach. And so how are we going to begin to reach that, uh, to tune into the right um, vibratory pattern? Well, it's a matter of uh, first recognizing this as possible mm -hmm. uh, and synthesizing the knowledge that we have from ancient traditions, which suggests that this is how the temples were constructed with what modern science is telling us is possible with our modern technology. We build with bricks and mortar and so forth. These are realities of construction. We also can build societies. We can build within the structure of our culture a great pyramid. In other words, a temple of initiation. So sacred architecture applies not only to the built environment, it applies to music, to art, to government, to social, stu social structure, um, to the food we eat. How we prepare for food is important. If we do this in a sacred manner, then we actually take in and incorporate into our bodies a pattern which then elevates us. Interesting. I had a teacher once who said that he had to select his cook with great care 
because uh, he had one cook that was always angry and as she prepared things, <clears throat> he could feel the difference as he would eat it. So he would dismiss her and he got another one in who loved what she was doing and prepared the food mm. imaginatively, lovingly, mm -hmm. and he said it helped his consciousness. Oh yeah. Makes I, sense. I had a friend in Boulder when I was just beginning to do my study in sacred architecture whose father was a uh, important in the Theosophical Movement in San Francisco and he had been brought up in Theosophical tradition. Mm -hmm. And I'd asked him about the validity of what I was doing with sacred uh, geometry. And he says, it doesn't matter. He was a contractor. What's okay. important is to build with love, prepare food with love. Because if you are centered in that part of yourself which is love, you will recognize the opportunities as they occur. You will naturally flow with the energies that are there and the possibilities that exist and unfold them as a natural process of what you're doing. Have you found that to be true, Bob, in your work? It's very difficult to do because as a, car, you know, as a con contractor, you need to assemble a crew of people who uh, uh, love to do what they're doing you know, and who sing together and impart that singing, that music into their work. So uh, we find more people that are like that. Uh, carpenters who are work with their hands and craft these beautiful pieces of furniture, for example, you sit in it and you literally vibrate to the energy that's in, mm -hmm. in, the, in the object. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. So your point is well taken about the food. Yeah. Well, it's something mm -hmm. I know that all of our viewers would be interested in. This is a very interesting spiral. Now, could you <clears throat> explain that one, please? Yeah, we're missing part of the picture in this one. There's actually a geometrical structure at the bottom of it. Mm -hmm. um, and this is an example of the idea of the hologram, mm -hmm. in which um, in the holographic plate, um, we have an interference pattern, which is created by two light beams that have been split, yin and yang, and brought back together and create an interference pattern that then when light or consciousness, if you will, is projected through, we get an image. Okay? Mm -hmm. Every part of this plate has within it, every piece, even the smallest, the image of the total. Okay? So within the smallest, we have the model of the cosmos. Okay? Buddha held up a flower, as his famous silent sermon, in which he was asked to explain the nature of the universe. And he held the flower up. And that's all he said was the okay. flower. That within the flower, within the pattern of the flower, you have everything you need to know. Okay? That's one reason we meditate upon the flowers, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so now, if we were now to, to kind of switch gears a little bit, we've talked a little about geometry in the universe, and we've talked about a little bit about the idea of the universe as being holographic. Uh, now let's look at the idea of mind. Mm -hmm. uh, we find that in the pattern of mind, a certain kind of geometry. Uh, there are several ways that this happens. Uh, quantum physicists are concluding now that there is no separation between reality that we observe, that we perceive with our senses, and our consciousness. That they are not separate, that they partake of the same essence. Um, there was some work done by a psychologist at UCLA by the name of Ron Siegel, who was working with hallucinogens at the time, and his purpose was to see what sort of patterns the mind progressed through as one went into an altered state of consciousness. And he found that there were a series of form constants, geometries, that the mind sequenced through. It's like going through a mandala. They started with a grid, a lattice. Uh -huh, you know, like we saw on that like, slide. Yeah. That um, then progressed to a cobweb, which is a radial grid, to then a cone, a tunnel, mm -hmm. and then finally a spiral. And after these progressions of geometry, one was in an altered state. And his conclusion was that there's a geometry in the mind that conditions our perception. Okay? Fascinating. So who says whether well, geometry in the universe or geometry in the mind, which come first, they are both take part of the same thing. Okay? So on the next slide, we have uh, an image of um, actually an ele electromagnetic field. Can we have the next slide? the electromagnetic field that is created um, by the activity of the brain itself, the electrical activity of the brain, creates this magnetic field, which is a geometry. Uh, it has uh, been shown that fluctuations in this field, which is to say changes in its geometry, uh, actually influence behavior, 
can change the structure of DNA, and certainly cause, cause illness. If you're sitting in front of a television or a, a computer too long, you're exposed to electromagnetic radiation that's influencing the geometry of your mind. And through the mind, your physical body. Okay. Now we exist within the planet, on the planet, within the planet's geometrical magnetic field, and so there's a reciprocity built up between our field, mental, mentally, and that of the planets. And so, what happens to one happens to the other, and vice versa. So we affect what the, happens to the planet. The planet affects what happens to us, which is really the basic idea of the temple. The temple is an overall field in which we experience ourselves. Our own mind is resonant to the pattern that is created by the field of the temple. Mm -hmm. okay? So we're really talking about the physical temple of the body, mm -hmm. the temple uh, of the mm -hmm. edifice, mm -hmm. the temple that is the earth. And the temple which is society itself. Uh -huh. Human beings together, the, the, the race, the culture, form a temple in which we experience ourselves. Mm -hmm. So the temple really is just a euphemism for the idea of vessel or body, the field of experience. The field of experience. Yeah. Well, I know that uh, I'm eager to hear more about um, the application of the, the temple in what you do in your work and also about the cosmic temple, which yeah. you've promised to tell us when you come back next week. Okay, very good. But, uh, oh, isn't that a pretty one? Look at that. Now, what one is that? This is a uh, computer-generated model of the brain. And it's nice because it demonstrates that the brain itself is a um, geometric field in which, uh, because of its activity, then we experience or we perceive reality. The point is that reality is a matter of neurons firing off in this brain that creates this geometrical interference pattern. Mm -hmm. So the reality boils down to the idea of perception. It exists here. It doesn't, it's not out there. To change reality, we change our perception, which is a matter of changing our symbolic language, which is the object of the temple and what we design. No wonder we say that um, uh, it all starts within. You change your reality by changing your thinking, and this is one of the, the things. Um, be ye renewed by the renewing of your mind. That's right. It's very important, isn't That's it? That's extremely important. Bob, it's been exciting having well, you here well, with you, us Helen. today. And next week, you will tell us about the Cosmic Temple. I will tell all next week. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. So do join us next week for more on Sacred Architecture with Bob Gulick on Facets of the Future. Thank you. Many facets of the future are appearing in our midst right now. New and unorthodox methods of healing and health, new ways of learning, new ways of reclaiming and expressing personal power. Many ancient arts are being resurrected and given futuristic application. Pour yourself a cup of tea and join Dr. Helen V. Walker and her guests as they discuss many interesting facets of the future. Welcome to Facets of the Future. I'm Helen Walker. Today we're having a continuation of the subject we started last week, sacred architecture. Our guest today is Robert Gulick, and we welcome you back, Bob. Thank you. Um, 
Bob is an architect, a planning commissioner, uh, one who has a great love and is trying to incorporate sacred architecture into the work that he's doing in his everyday life. And as we found last week, it has a great deal to do with each one of us. I know that you also have been teaching some classes in sacred architecture, is that correct? That's right. I've taught a 12-week seminar class at Boulder College in Boulder on sacred architecture, which uh, drew a small crowd. I think they were actually expecting art history. It turned out to be applied metaphysics, and uh, there's some demand for it to be repeated. Oh, yeah. that's wonderful. Yeah. I know that there's going to be a great deal of interest um, in the next few weeks, months, in this whole subject. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad that you are, are teaching and making it available right. to more of us. Right. Would you be willing to recap <clears throat> just a bit, Bob, what we discussed last week uh, so okay. that we can understand today's application better? Okay, very simply, we will uh, uh, condense the cosmic overwhelm into a couple statements here. <laughs> Good. Uh, basically, we are talking about the application of the principles of cosmogenesis of natural law as it applies to creation to the world we create for ourselves. And we do it for basically the same reason that the Creator does, in order to experience ourselves, to place ourselves into existence. And to do that such that we can connect and always maintain the link to our source. We talked a lot about form as the connection between mind or consciousness as it embodies in matter, form and pattern, the pattern that connects, for example, as the way we maintain this link, and that uh, characteristic states of consciousness or planes of uh, consciousness, dimensions, have a vibratory or frequency pattern, a geometry, which we can uh, resonate to sympathetically in the environment that we create if it is a reflection of these patterns and therefore maintain that higher awareness in our consciousness through this resonation. And of course we were mentioning how uh, doing this within the, the physical body but also within uh, architecture, within uh, the planet, uh, this whole connecting uh, link in finding that we are one with the cosmos. That's right. And when we talk about architects, we're really talking about everything that we create, not just buildings or landscapes or cities. We're talking about the language as a symbolic environment. We're talking about music. We're talking about art. We're talking about government and social structure as well. So all these things become, in fact, a temple, a body in which we experience ourselves. What would all of this do for um, government buildings? Government buildings, huh? Well, if one were to design, to design with sacred architecture to create a government environment, you are creating a harmony which then comes through in terms of administration. Uh, we would start to recognize uh, our relationship to the planet, to other nations, that we are all one at certain levels. There's no distinction between us and they that we are all the same in essence, and I think it would change our politics completely. Wow, mm -hmm. if we would do something for the United Nations building along this, uh, this line of architecture. We could heal the planet. <laughs> this right. is what we should be doing. That's right. Uh, I think that's wonderful. You mentioned uh, um, also last time about the, the use of numbers and geometry in all of this as the basis for architecture. Is that correct? Well, the tradition in sacred architecture comes to us in the West primarily through Pythagoras and his school. Pythagoras taught uh, four of what were called the liberating arts. Liberating arts were arts, the classical curriculum, that in fact allowed you to disassociate or disattach from matter. That's why they're called liberating. Uh, the four were called the quadrivium, and they had to do with number with geometry, with music, and what he called astrology, was, which was really patterns of number within time and space. Cosmic dance, if you will. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. So today we want to talk more about the application and moving okay. into the, um, the temples. All right. Yes, today is sort of a grounding of the theory that we developed last week uh, to show how in traditional um, philosophies and uh, architecture, uh, this wisdom was incorporated. In fact, we would, it's so much of it's in architecture because it, uh, it's hard evidence. It survives where mm -hmm. written material has not. And uh, temples were actually teaching universities and the wisdom was actually built into the physical structure. 
And we have so remnants of temples so all they're, around. They're open books. In mm -hmm. fact, like like this is a book we had. We have temples. We showed this one last week. On uh, is a good beginning book, Sacred Geometry. Yes. If this is the best, probably to start with. It it is a fairly good synthesis. I brought another one this week, which I think uh, would be the second book I would recommend to someone. It's written by John Michelle, called The New View Over Atlantis. The new view over Atlantis. Over Atlantis. And also has information on geomancy, or earth energies in it, mm -hmm. uh, which is another aspect of sacred architecture that we have not been able to get into at any length yet. So we can. All right. I think that this would be very good. What is the, the new view over Atlantis, though? The new view is a matter of remembering, bringing forward in time the wisdom that that ancient, very high civilization used to create their culture and their architecture so that we might now reapply it to what we're creating that today. How much of this, Bob, is intuitive and how much is seen in the ancient uh, Egyptian temples? Or Mayan temples, for that matter? Well, there's a great deal uh, of both, really. Um, the information is scattered in bits and pieces. It's holographic in a way. We've got a piece in each tradition that has the essential truth, but it's not the whole picture yet. It's not filled in with detail. So we need an intuitive wisdom to help synthesize these pieces together to create the big picture. And right. We're reconstituting a, a knowledge system, basically. So how do you apply this? I apply it carefully. <laughs> uh, because sacred architecture is a spiritual path, want, in order to project to the divine into what you create, you have to connect within yourself first to create outside, you have to see the sacred in nature, okay? So it is a spiritual path, a, uh, a means of, of conscious, consciousness expansion for myself. We certainly can see that um, uh, you look within to see the other dimensions. Mm -hmm. Rather than looking out to find it, you have to look within and then you see it without. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes, the pattern of the whole is inside. The universe is within your heart. So I'd like to see some of the things that you have um, okay. developed here. Let's start with the first slide, which uh, is a painting by William Blank, Blake uh, entitled The Ancient of Days, who in biblical terms was the creator of the Earth Logos. And he's shown here with compass. The creator uh, creation in, in total is created by means of geometry, the compass which is the symbol of the Trinity, the triangle, the being triangle the means by which creation occurs. So uh, this is an ancient mystical um, piece of knowledge and here brought forward most recently in the poetry of William Blake. Our next slide um, is actually a composite. I've overlaid here uh, the circle with the, the point within the middle, the point here being the sun, as the ancient symbol of the cosmos. It is universal no matter whether you're talking to an aborigine in Australia or you're talking to a Hindu in the Tibetan highlands. It symbolizes the idea that the universe is a sphere, is perfect, that in the center, the I am presence expands through space to create what Plato called becoming, from being to becoming through space. Space is the second principle of the creation. It relates existence back to the creator. And Plato, in Timaeus, built a whole cosmology based on geometry. And he said within the space between being and becoming are the geometric solids. And they are a matrix that organize the chaos, the elements. And each of these solids related then to uh, one of the elements, earth, fire, water, air, which are another way of saying mental, physical, emotional, spiritual planes. And so a progression through these geometrical matrices was in fact a progression through these various states of being back to the creator, to the source. Okay. Now you have this, as I understand it, also in the uh, Great Pyramids. Yeah, we're going to see that uh, geometry a little bit later on in the show. Uh, what I wanted to go back to this one slide here because uh, th there's a Hindu tradition as well with, with uh, sacred geometry. Okay, now if we go back to this slide, we're actually seeing uh, in Hindu tradition a similar kind of cosmology built out of the Platonic solids, but in this case, we're progressing from monad to soul to physical body, which was the cube, to the totality of manifestation represented by the dodecahedron, and finally mm -hmm. all of that enclosed within the icosahedron, which was the thought of God. 
And all of this then created a universe which you, know, you progress through as, uh, as you evolve spiritually. So uh, we, now we can go on to the next slide, which would show Kepler's model of the solar system. Kepler, we can thank for the laws of planetary motion, uh, was also a mystic. And he found that in the relationship of the orbits of the planet, we could describe spheres which related successively to the platonic solids. So we have within our own solar system this idea of the platonic solids as we progress through it. Interestingly enough, uh, the Earth, the orbit of the Earth, is mm -hmm. inscribed and circumscribed only by the icosahedron and the dodecahedron itself, which are manifestation and pure thought in mm -hmm. Hindu tradition. Interesting. Yeah. The next slide gives you an example of geometry that we find in nature. Not only in the solar system, we find it in structure of natural forms. Here are the virus. We've got two that are represented by the icosahedron above and the dodecahedron below. And here we have the most elementary form of life on our planet being pure geometry. And then the next level is almost an octave above. The next slide shows the planetary grid system of the planet. Now this is the, what's called the Earth crystal. It's the pattern, the master pattern of the planet's nervous system, energy system, and they alternate between being icosahedral and dodecahedral. This has actually been photographed from space. It's, the theory's been developed by the Russians and been photographed by their space satellites. You know, these patterns of the planet. It centers on uh, the Great Pyramid of Giza, by the way. Uh -huh. yeah, the whole pattern works out of that. So we have an octave of experience from pure geometry of the virus to pure geometry of the planet. Experience of life on our world. Does that have something to do with the placement of the uh, Pyramid of Giza? I think so. I think it is key to energizing the planetary grid system. As were cultures, the ancient cultures all over the planet were placed at strategic places within the grid so that uh, they activated and were able to draw out of the grid for their own use. These energy points that we hear about, about the <coughs> Earth, um, have, do they have a special place within this grid? Each uh, intersection within the grid uh, has a different kind of meaning. Uh, intersections of, or let's say within the center of the pentagons. We have areas of um, an anonomic activity like Bermuda Triangle or the South Japan Sea uh, where things go haywire. Ships and planes disappear. And there are 10 places like this on the planet, yeah, for example. Mm -hmm. Just 10? Just 10. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be very interesting. Ooh, isn't this a pretty one? Okay. So we have this experience of going through geometry symbolized by a mandala. Uh, in every tradition has these cosmological diagrams. They symbolize the cosmos. Mm. I'd like to learn quite a bit more about this and mandalas that we see in so many places. But uh, we're going to have to take a short break right okay. now. We'll come back. So we'll come back to this and hear more about the, the mandala patterns. All right. So stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Facets of the Future. We're speaking with uh, Robert Gulick, an architect and one very interested in sacred architecture. And we were just talking about the mandalas. Uh, you were showing us a picture right, of... I had a Tibetan mandala up on the screen. Just a well, This is it. Uh, actually, it's entitled, uh, in English translation, The Great Powers of the Divine Mother. And we're, t we're talking about uh, the powers within manifestation itself. The process of reapproaching the Creator, the Absolute, is going from the outside, which in Eastern mandalas or diagrams is outside the di diagram. This is physical existence, and one approaches the Creator through the temple to the center. One aligns oneself with the Creator or with that state of higher being uh, through a successive alignments with the geometries which are incorporated within the mandala. Now, ancient temples, for example, which is on the next slide, uh, the Bora Badur in Java, uh, were actually projections, three-dimensional projections, right out of the mandalas themselves. And interacting with the temple was actually a process of going through the mandala, which was the temple, in a certain way. And um, you know, this, for example, has nine tiers, which were the nine pathways to nirvana. Okay. It's interesting how uh, it seems to have the square, and then you come into the sphere. The temple was always based on the square, the square being symbolic of earth or matter, because one had to contact perfection in matter in the physical plane before one could contact perfection in the spiritual plane. 
And another reason for it was that in uh, entering through the temple, one had to be able to ground the experience gained within the sanctuary, so one always went back out through the square, which was uh, into matter again. We see this uh, certainly in the, um, the Temple of Solomon uh, and in the uh, tabernacle of the um, Egyptians in the wilderness, uh, not the Egyptians, but of the Hebrews in the Hebrews, wilderness. Hebrews, yes. The, the tabernacle right. in the wilderness was a double square. And af actually, in the Hebrew tradition, the body was called the tabernacle in the wilderness. And we could compare the Temple of Solomon to the temple, which is humanity in total, and New Jerusalem then to the earth in a perfect state of being in which the kingdom is manifest. Very good. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit more about the, uh, the pyramid and the energies with that. The pyramid geometry is, is just a few slides away. All right. Okay, if we can do that. No, I didn't mean to. <clears throat> Go ahead. Okay, if we can have the next slide. Um, as another example from another tradition, uh, this being from Navajo, Native American, we have mandalas that were actually used for healing, for example, combined with chants to create a psychic atmosphere, a psychic architecture in which, in this case, a patient actually was able to get into. So this the, is a sand painting that they're sand sitting painting at. Sand painting that this, uh, this child is sitting in, yes, which then incorporates the powers that are symbolized by the diagram. And so she's absorbing that energy. Okay, the next slide. Ah, so we're going to get to the pyramids finally. <laughs> this is actually a Zen painting symbolizing the universe by Zen guy. It's entitled The Universe. And we have the circle being the absolute, the creator, the mm -hmm. universe, uh, on one hand, and the square being matter on the other. So we've got spiritual existence and material existence. And what joins these together are the trinity, the triangle. So the gateway from matter to spirit is through the trinity and form the triangle or the pyramid, if you will. So the next slide. Ah, here we go, the there pyramid, finally. Circling the square is a very ancient geometrical symbol. Uh, it really means equating matter, which is the square, to spirit, which is the circle. And it's done by means of a very special kind of triangle. The triangle is the Great Pyramid. The base of the pyramid, in this case, is the square, side of the square. The height of the pyramid is the radius of the circle. And when we circle the square, we are equating the circumference of the circle to the perimeter of the square. And so they are equal. They are equalized in balance. And the pyramid geometry does that. It's the gateway then from matter to higher consciousness. We can see that also in uh, uh, spirituality. When we hear of uh, no one can come unto the Father except through me, we're talking about going to the, the, the cosmos through the physical matter of the human. That's right. As a matter of fact, the triangle is created by an intersection of two circles, of which we might symbolize then as spiritual realm and material realm. And that creates a fish shape, which is the symbol of the Christ, the teacher for our age. Through him, through the triangle, then we are able to go from material existence to spiritual existence. You were showing how we could, uh, with the human body, with our arms, um, make that uh, uh, symbol? Oh, oh yes, yes. Uh, the eye shape. The eye uh, shape. When you put your arms, and quite often we do this subconsciously, to the, put, so our hands are on the crown chakra. We focus our attention through the third eye, basically, and actually create an eye shape by our arms in which our head and is the eye and the third, the third eye, eye is the pupil. Okay, so it's a way of concentrating and contacting intuitive wisdom. Okay, next slide. Okay. We were talking about how we do this with our body. The actual geometry which is incorporated in the Great Pyramid, which we call golden proportion, is in our body itself. Uh, from our feet to our navel, mm -hmm. uh, to our navel to our head, mm -hmm. those are related as the golden proportion, as the base to the height of the pyramid. Okay? So within our physical structure, we have a Great Pyramid ourselves. In other words, humanity or the human being in a perfected state of being is the gateway himself, herself, ourself, between materialism, spiritualism, okay? What well, certainly is a familiar okay. uh, symbol and uh, diagram that we have right. seen in literature. The, um, 
the wisdom of this proportioning, this golden proportioning, was reborn um, again in the Renaissance, which is why Leonardo da Vinci's diagram here symbolizes this. Actually, you're seeing the human body as the means of circling the square. But uh, it's not completely understood in, in all the, the art history texts of what this diagram means. OK, next one. Uh, in alchemical tradition, we have a very similar kind of thing. Uh, here we see uh, the alchemical a magician with his compass, mm -hmm. geometer's tool. And the motto that goes with this is make a circle out of a man and a woman. In other words, fuse duality represented by male and female into the androgyny. Out of that, create a circle, the inner circle. Out of that, a square. Out of that, a triangle. And finally, a circle, and you have the philosopher's stone, which was the means of transmuting gross material to gold. It's our matter to spirit. It's a matter of fusion, and it's done through geometry. Okay. Another one. We have the same kind of symbolism here with the idea of circling the square through the star. The star itself has golden proportions in it. The base of a five-pointed star is related to its diagonal, the slant, mm -hmm. as the height of the pyramid is to its slant. It is one to what is called phi, the golden proportion. And this is why the star is a symbol for Christ, because he represents the mediation between uh, matter and man and God. So and this is why in the next slide we have uh, the Celtic cross, the idea of the Christ crucified in matter, which is the cross, another way of doing the square is a cross shape. And that mediates between the cross and the circle, which is heaven. So and of course, that's a very ancient symbol, too. Yes. Predates Christianity by thousands of years. Yes, yes, it does. Okay. Next. Uh, this geometry we have incorporated in many different temples. Here is the uh, facade of the Parthenon in Greece. It has gold proportions all through it. Here I've overlaid a uh, five pointed star to show some of that. The height to the width is one to the golden proportion. As a matter of fact, the ancients used units of measure also in their temples. Hmm. which uh, related the temple to the place on the earth. Now, the width of the Parthenon is exactly 100 Greek cubits calculated at the place Athens. So the temple relates man to the planet at the place. I had no idea that that was behind the, the Parthenon. The units of measure are very critical. They give meaning to the diagrams. Okay, next one I think will be Stonehenge. Uh, a plan view showing some of the geometries overlaid on it. Um, this is an interlaced uh, five-point star pattern which connects the intersections to establish all the rings within it. And one can locate the heel stone, which is the stone from which you can cite the equinoxes and solstices. Okay, the next. Well, we certainly all have read about Stonehenge being an astronomical um, uh, temple, and yes. you can see the, the sun and so forth. Yes, it's, it's almost as if the ancients reflected the pattern of the cosmos right on the ground. And these, these patterns were geometrical, and by means of them then they could calculate ellipses, eclipses, equinoxes, uh, the risings and settings, uh, maximum declinations of the moon, and so forth, through the geometry. Yeah. They okay. were really wise. <laughs> um, the Gothic arch as well was determined by golden proportions. Mm. So that when you entered the church, you were clarified in your being. You were raised up, became perfected in your being, so that when you approached the altar, you were already in a higher state of consciousness. And so in the next slide, we show the whole nave of Chartres Cathedral resonated to this geometry, OK? This geometry of perfection. Because the five-pointed star represented perfection in human form. Okay. Interesting. You know, when, uh, years ago when I went through this cathedral, I found that, uh, you know, I was in awe of all of it, but I had no idea what was happening to me as I walked down the aisle. Yeah. As we were talking about last week, there were several traditions that came together here. The Freemasons, the Kabbalists, the alchemists all brought their wisdom together to build Chartres Cathedral, which was built amazingly in about 20 years. Day and night, people all over Europe came. They built bonfires. It was a sacred act. Yeah. You can feel it. Yeah. Oh, and look at this. Okay, this is a view from the south entrance. 
you're actually seeing through the open doors of which uh, the figure of the Christ is the column, and behind him the north rose window, which is symbolic of the causal body. Now it has a specific geometry, which you'll see in the next slide, which defines uh, whirling squares and triangles, and that defines a spiral when we start connecting the different points within that mandala pattern. The spiral path is the successive path through states of existence, incarnations, lifetimes, by which, through which we gain experience to approach the Creator at the center again. Yeah. The maze right. of Chart, this is on the floor of Chart. On the floor right there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If we could run through the next ones fairly quickly, we circle a square through a spiral in the Kaaba, in the Islamic mm -hmm. tradition, or in the next slide, for example, bees do it in a honeycomb by uh -huh. the very dance. And this is how we approach the cosmos, which is also, in the next slide, a spiral. And this is what we are seeing from um, our great astronomy, uh, great, uh, um, what am I trying to say? The, um, well, the observatories that we are, mm -hmm. are getting all these pictures now, showing how the cosmos yeah. is right there, yeah. and yet it is within us. Sure. A fascinating thing. Mm -hmm. Bob? This is a wonderful series. I hope that you will give a class in this soon. I know that there are going to be many people interested. I'm getting this. <laughs> thank you so much for being You're with very us welcome, Helen. on this subject of sacred architecture. And thank you for joining with us on Facets of the Future. And this is the future, building in this manner.